Welcome to the Larry Kreider's Leadership Podcast. Larry is the author of over 40 books, the founder of Dove International, a worldwide family of churches and ministries in six continents, and has over 50 years of leadership experience. He and his guests will share inspirational leadership insights from their journey with God. These insights, gleaned from serving leaders in many nations, will transform your life and leadership. For more information on Larry's books and resources, visit LarryKreider.com. Welcome to the Larry Kreider Leadership Podcast. Larry Kreider here in the studio with me today is my friend from Winchester, Virginia, Nick Payne. Welcome. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here with you. So with this, we're doing leadership stuff on this podcast, and obviously you're involved in so much leadership, doing so many things. You are the Dove USA Youth Director. You work with youth pastors all over the United States of America, right? Yeah. Yes, sir. Okay, you do that. And then in your spare time, you're also <laughs> you're also Associate Pastor uh, in Winchester, Virginia of Crossroads Church. Am I right? That is correct. Right, and you're starting a company again, right? <laughs> yep. A coffee company. Yep. <laughs> you got a lot going. We're going to talk about leadership and how you handle all this stuff. <laughs> all right. All right. All right. Let's just get started from the beginning. By the way, are there any other roles in leadership I'm missing? Uh, husband and yeah, of course, uh, that's a big one. I used to have a tagline that said "son, husband, and not quite a dad," and so <laughs> sort of a dad now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. Tell us about that. Yeah, it's been amazing. Uh, really, it's we've looked at it as you know continuing to sow into the next generation because okay. of the spiritual heritage of the young girl that's living w with us now. And how you old know, is she? She's two and a half, wow. and so really supporting a family mm -hmm. that was has been part of our ministry in the Beautiful. past, and you know so we're just really you know being the gospel for this young person. Yeah, and I t you grew up in Virginia or some other place. So I grew up in Southern Maryland, outside okay. of DC. Okay. And and uh, it's about two and a half hours from where I currently live. Nick and Emily, you guys wrote a book. And by the way, for the show notes, you can check out a book called The Secret Place of Devotion. Nick and Emily Payne, 30 Day Devotional Guide. Remember when this came out? It's a great job on this. Helping you build the blueprint for a, the secret place, just loving Jesus more. Fantastic. Uh, so, so talk to me about why yeah, did you write this book? I was at a youth conference in, in Tennessee in 2019, 2020 yeah. at, the, at New Year's. And I was leaving the uh, main auditorium and I heard the Lord say the secret place of devotion. Wow. And so we've are, we've always been part of our ministry, helping young people, mm -hmm. young, young adults, even new believers develop their prayer life. And so mm -hmm. I've always had the desire to write and I've never just taken the initiative to do it. And so when I heard that, I immediately went to, you know, I could write a devotional for young people and how to develop their, their, their prayer life and not just, you know, let's just read some scripture and pray, yeah. but actually like a journaling, you know, mm -hmm. scriptural yep. praying, so sitting quietly before the Lord. Mm -hmm. And so, um, we, I just did it. And within like a month I had my, my portion written, wow. I'd done all 30 days. And then Emily was working a pretty heavy job. So it mm -hmm. took her a little longer to get her piece done. It's not, you know, that she took too long. She just yeah. had a very busy in life. And so once we got it done, it was super thrilling and exciting to see that finished product so of cool. you getting to do it. And then our goal with this, this is funny, is uh, maybe it's not funny, but it's a bad uh, financial plan, is to lose as much money in this book as we can. Oh, really? I want to give this away to so to as many people. And so we have been blessed with people buying the book, sure. but I've given away probably three times as wow. many as we've written, including a digital copy too, wow. that we gave away at winter retreat. The dove does every, uh, every yeah. January, we yeah. gave away 96 digital downloads and wow. then 35 books that so uh, winter cool. retreat. Yeah. So that's very exciting. Hard. That, that's so, so, so cool. So talk to us about how, how you gave your life to Christ. So Ray, growing up, I was raised Catholic. Yeah. And so I really knew who Jesus was okay. and not just because I saw him hanging on a cross sure. in the home and on Sundays right. and, and at school, but I really knew who Jesus was. Mm -hmm. And then I kind of knew who Holy Spirit was, not a whole lot, but I never really understood God as father. Mm -hmm. And so we had a tragedy hit our family when I was 13. Mm -hmm. We lost our house in a, in a, in a fire. And so our family really experienced a big, you know, 
tragedy in her life. And so our family came together, yet I sort of walked away from my faith in okay. Christ. And so it was, you know, I didn't really have, you know, mentors in my life. I mean, I had some, but I didn't understand what a mentor sure, you know, was or really what discipleship was. Right. So, you know, fast forward from, you know, 13, 14 years old mm-hmm. up to I'm 29 on the floor of a pizza shop is right. where God became father to me. Wow. Talk you about know, that. Through this experience, through this, and a, a general act of kindness of somebody hearing from the Lord on a need that I had uh-huh. at the time I needed to have hernia surgery. I had a need to pay for the surgeon. It was $550. We had started attending a church locally near us from a customer at our restaurant that had invited us sure. to come. And so, um, I, didn't really share with anybody at the church what my need was because I don't really know many people and so I'm not that public of a person about things like that. And so uh, the pastor's wife came through our drive-thru one day and handed me an envelope with $500 in it and said, somebody wanted to sow a love seed into you. And so that act right there revealed God as Father, God as a provider to me. And so I was 29 years old on the floor of a pizza shop. And that's when I surrendered my life. I felt like it was that's a, amazing. I felt like it was a, a Damascus road. My Damascus sure. road experience sure. was on the floor of a pizza shop. And then Emily, your wife came to Christ later. Or? So no, she was actually already on her journey and, was this, she? and she had okay. already been praying for me. She oh. had been, you know, baptized in Holy spirit. Yeah. She had been, you know, really on fire for Christ. And she's just, and it wasn't that long a time frame because we hear stories all the time of like people, you know, coming to faith in the Lord and then years later, a spouse. Right. The, you, this is like a couple of months. This is a very wow. short time frame of wow. me just getting the revelation of God as Father. Yeah, yeah. You know, you came to Christ in your twenties, and now you're talking about areas of leadership you're involved in today. Yeah, just give me that journey. I mean, I didn't have it overnight. It did not. Well, so. Because I'm in my late 20s, you know, I'm 29 when I come to the Lord. I've already been in le- levels of leadership in right. my life. You know, from when I was young and in culinary program, I was a chef for a number of years, yep. and so I was um, given tasks and given leadership roles at a young age, even in high school, and okay. then going into the workforce. You know, given levels of leadership because of character, because of you know weight that I can carry that others you know not sure. necessarily couldn't. Plus, you know, it also helps there's a little bit of talent involved too that right, you right. that you do know what you're doing sure and so i already had sort of a base built of right. leadership and so when i came to the lord in my late 20s i was able to you know reflect back through the years mm. and see sort of god even working in this provenient grace mm-hmm. you know before i yeah, really yeah. came to the lord and really you know working through me in some areas and so when i came to my you know surrendered moment and then I immediately just wanted to start serving in the church. So I served in youth ministry because i am always been good with young people. You know, mm-hmm. we had a lot of young people that worked at our restaurant. Sure. You know, in my whole life, I've always hung out with, you know, people my age, maybe a little bit younger. And so um, it really just became like a natural process more than a calling. Mm-hmm. And so I just started serving. That was the area. And so from there. So just, whatever is before you to it, do, I do just it. started serving yeah. and kept building on from there and building on from there. Yeah. Yeah. So when you look back now, you know, when you were younger and just get involved in leadership, if there's some things you could change, what would they be? Understanding what a mentor really is. Okay, talk more about that. So I had a few people throughout my life that I would, that I, would, I look back and consider mentors. A teacher, my culinary teacher in high school, okay. um, a my third grade and sixth grade teacher at a Catholic school. Mm-hmm. She, she was my uh, sponsor for being confirmed in the church. And um, then later on, a chef that uh, took me with him to a nice restaurant. I was like his guy on the team. So I've had these like leaders in my life that were invested in me, but I didn't have the right mindset to understand what they were doing for me. Mm. Because I don't think they really intentionally were doing something. Sure. So if I could go back, I wish I could understand mentorship and then be able to like allow them to, you know, really pour into my life, but then allow me to receive what they're Right, yeah. right. Yeah, we often use the term spiritual father, spiritual yes. mother. It's all the same thing, making disciples, mentors, mentoring, I mean, on and on. And it is just so important to understand, not only to have mentors, 
but then to become mentors you yes. know, for others. And we're all, we all need that. You know, we need yeah. peers, obviously. But we need those who speak into our lives and then those that we're helping to help grow at, at the same time. So talk to me about teamwork. I mean, you lead teams right now. And what you do in WSA, pastors, youth pastors throughout the nation, isn't just you. You've got a team of people you work with. You're an associate pastor in a local church. You work with teams. Talk to me about teamwork. How does that work? I've always been on teams, whether really? it was, you know, sports as a child. You know, I did was raised in a house with three siblings. Yeah. So you had to learn how to play well with others. <laughs> <laughs> not saying that uh-huh. uh, not saying that only children don't know how to play well on teams, but, you know, just kind of ingrained in my yeah. childhood and then yeah. worked on teams. Yeah. And then, you know, my formative years in uh, my cooking career. You work in kitchens. You have to be a good right. part of a team. If right. you're not a good team player, yep. then you're going to be, it, it's a detriment to everybody. Right. And so that was sort of just ingrained in me as I was young. So mm-hmm. as I grow up, I sort of developed my bridge building aspect of my leadership to where, and it's not that I'm passive and I don't want to have conflict right. around me, but I want to be a bridge builder so in order to enhance the team, in order for the team to cohesively work better. And sometimes that's bridging some gaps with individuals that some people would mm-hmm. might have burned a bridge with. Mm-hmm. And so mm-hmm. um, kind of just been there from the foundation. Yeah. So as you look back, you know, uh, how old are you now? 43. Yeah. We're a young man. You look back over <laughs> these years. Hey, I'm I almost know. 73, man. Uh, You're I, young. I know. <laughs> <laughs> you look back. Uh, what are some things you say? I wish you would have known that years ago. You know, I wish when we started, I would have changed this. What are some changes you would have made, do you think? Sometimes I wish that I would have uh, never walked away from my faith. Yeah. Or, you know, in my yeah. late teens and 20s. Mm-hmm. But then the Lord reminds me that it's okay that yeah. you did because you learned things that others True. might necessarily would have. But, um, you know, if I were to look back, you know, there's not a ton I would change just because, you know, your journey is what it is. And, mm-hmm. you know, there's things that I've learned along the way that I've, uh, I'm ecumenical. You know, in my, you know, walk, I, I'll listen to reformed people. I'll, you know, I'll listen to leadership podcasts, all, you know, within the church, outside of the church. And so I think that's always been a big, a healthy aspect of my development. Mm -hmm. Um, But I I don't know if there would be much, you know, to change. Okay. Yeah. Well, now that I have you in the studio with me, we've done this thing over the last couple of months where we give people an opportunity to ask me questions. Oh, right. And so I'm going to have you help me answer this question for today. We call okay. it Ask Larry. Okay. The question to ask Larry today is, what's the hardest thing about leadership? What's the hardest now, thing? You think about that for a while. I, I think I know for me what it is. I think the hardest thing about leadership is leading myself. I think so. Because as I really get honest and look at life and leadership and all that I've walked through in leadership, I think, you know, every day realizing that I need to lead myself live a disciplined life. I need to lead myself growing close to God every day. Lead myself and not taking up an offense, you know. And really lead myself, I think, in some ways could be the hardest thing. And yet the most important thing, because you, you can't lead others unless you lead yourself properly. So what would you say? What's the hardest thing about leadership for you? I agree with that, but I'll take it a little step further Please and do. say that I leading in the home and leading yourself and leading in the home. So good. Because in the home, that's where vulnerable things happen. Yes, so good. And then leading your spouse if you're married. Mm-hmm. You know, if you're single, leading yourself is going to be challenging enough. But then yeah. when you're leading within your home to where, you know, so good. you're not gonna want to, you know, push them too far on something yeah. or, you know, be, you know, angry or you know, then that yeah. puts it back onto yourself and whether or not you're you're leading. So I think leading in the home, leading yourself first and that's leading good. in the home kind that's of good goes right along the same way. Talk to me about youth leadership. I mean, you, you're involved in many areas of leadership, but for anyone who's a youth pastor, desiring to be a youth pastor, or maybe a pastor of a church saying, we've got some youth, I don't know what to do. Uh, talk to me about youth leadership. What are some gems, things you've learned that would help our listeners today? How long do we have? I'm just kidding. <laughs> it's been um, a long time. Yeah, we, have, we have 10 more minutes. Go for it. <laughs> um, youth ministry is should be an extension of the home first yes. and the mission of the church. Okay, very good. Youth ministry should not be its own, out on its own thing. That's not, uh, you know, I've, I've seen some tough things where youth pastors take on a little too much responsibility. Sure. But our ministry has always been based on, we want to be an extension of what 
honoring parents right. and honoring discipleship in the home first, then discipleship within the church and out in the community. Mm-hmm. And so the, the first nugget is be an extension of the home, Great. you know, and that involves getting to know the parents, getting mm-hmm. to know youth, you know, the youth right. so that you can help and be an extension for the parents. Cause sometimes right. it's tough conversation with kids mm-hmm. because honoring your parents is a challenging thing. And so, um, and then it's, you know, you said in the beginning, spiritual fathering and yeah. mothering, like that's what, you know, youth pastors should be doing is that, right. you, and but you're also should be raising up other leaders within your group to help you do that because you can't do it all yourself. You have mm-hmm. to have a support team around you because we can always do more when we have a group. And so building a team around you is also uh, just as important. So how do you practically serve youth pastors throughout our nation? I know you do it well. How do you, how does that, what does that look like? It's, I mean, I don't want to say it's challenging from the standpoint of like, it's hard to do. It's challenging because everybody's by, a lot of them are bivocational. Okay. And so you don't want to put uh, too much on them right. during work hours or in mm-hmm. the evening to Good. take away from family. And so a lot of times supports just, you know, being there for them for things. It's not necessarily always a phone call. Text, email, you know, is a great way to, you know, at sure. least keep in touch with some. But phone calls, you know, really do matter, too. And yeah. so because I can't be everywhere and I'm still really young in the role of, you know, it's not quite a year that I've been doing it. I'm still, right. you know, navigating my way and, you know, meeting a lot of people and learning, yeah. uh, you know, what their vision is for their group or their area. But um Leaning on those areas of communication are probably really good at first. And then obviously face to faces are always great. Sure. Things like that. Sure. Talk to me yet about as you work with youth pastors throughout the country, uh, what are what are youth pastors facing today that might be different than a generation ago? In fact, what are young people facing today that's different than it was a generation or two ago? Can you speak to that? It this is challenging because isn't it? You know, we sometimes can get fed into like ideologies and the differences of political things that are that the West is facing today. Because I right. can only speak to the United States. I can't sure. speak to you know the the rest of the world, but. Uh, I'm reminded regularly of Ecclesiastes where there's nothing new under the sun. Mm. And so, and even within the Roman Empire, we've seen examples of the very thing that we're going through today, the Roman Empire and the early church yeah. dealt with. And so, um, you know, I have the joke True. that you're not going to get away with me without quoting somebody that was in the first century. Right. I might not quote the verbatim now, but I'm going to refer back to the early churches. We can look through history and see how things yeah. were dealt with. And so when we think about what we're facing today, we can kind of thread that in to give uh, you know, a little bit of insight, but you know, they're facing the same thing as always family struggles. Yeah. You know, there's issues at home, there's gender things that kids are young and they're formative in their development. So there could be questioning their sexuality. There could be questioning, uh, you know, what their thoughts are in life, whether they actually believe what their parents are saying, or are they just going to vicariously live through their parents? And so the youth pastors are facing that just as much as maybe yeah. like we might see on social media with the yeah. political, okay. and, you know, gender ideologies yep. and things. I, I hear you. Next question I have for you uh, has to do with multiple streams of income. Mm. Now, I can tell you've chosen that. I mean, you're involved as in associate, pastor, associate pastor, you work with WSA Youth, you're starting a business. Like, why would you start a business when you've got so much going already? How, what's that look like to you, the whole multiple streams of income thing? Most people I interview are doing one thing. And I, a few are doing more. And I, I, I recommend multiple streams of income. So that's part of the reason I'm asking this. But talk to me about how that works for you and why you do that. This is a relatively new thing for me. Okay. Um, for most of my life, I didn't understand what that was okay. until probably the last five years. Okay. And then the last two years, I've been really starting to walk it out a little bit more. Maybe some investment, you know, some, sure. you know, other things. But uh, I've always had the business that we're starting is not just for an income. That's actually okay. for a ministry. Okay. And so uh, I had a vision. Emily and I both had a vision and not an open vision, just a dream Understand. vision that uh, when we first came back to the Lord of a discipleship training school for young people. Okay. And so I, um, within that, I wanted to have an outlet for young people to be able to learn something, learn a trade, Good. have a job. Good. And coffee is a you know passion in my life. Sure. And so I, you know, it just hit me, you know, probably in 2016 that that could be uh, an initial start and then bring a team around me 
that might have another area that they can help a young person grow in. And so the business that we're doing now is really trying to develop the framework or structure in order to build a ministry for the next section in life. Cause I know I'm young and I'm 43, but I'm thinking about the future. I'm thinking 20 years down the road yep, and I'm wise. not thinking retirement. I'm thinking of how can exactly. I build for the future? And so this is really about building f- for the future. Yeah. Yes, it will be some revenue for me because I'll be working, you know, that, you know, owner with three other people who are in ministry with me. You know, we're, I'm not going out alone. I have two other men, uh, two other friends that are in it with me. And so, uh, but to get back to the question of multiple streams of income, it is really important for us to think in those terms, you know, and if you're, and if you're not thinking of it, that doesn't mean you're wrong. Right. You know, it's just, that's just for you. But for me, I kind of need that. I have this brain that's kind of always working and Mm -hmm. moving quickly. And so I need that to sort of like, and I don't Mm -hmm. know if it's ADD or whatever, but that's the way my brain works. I have to have a lot going on at once. It's like cooking in a kitchen, right? You have a lot of multitasking at one time. And that's really just my life. You know, your age is an interesting age because there's a whole generation that looks at you as old, you yeah, know, you, you work with this, this old guy, forty three, <laughs> and my generation says you're young. Yeah. You know, you're kind of stuck right in the middle of that. What are some key issues you find Christian leaders facing today? I um, probably one of the biggest issue is sticking your head in the sand uh-huh. and not willing to have difficult conversations of what's facing our society and church today. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, there's a lot of being said right now that, you know, we live in a post-Christian world, you know, just look at the way that, you know, sort of some things have gone. You could say that started in the late 1700s and kind of carried on to today. But I think that if we're not willing to have difficult conversations, because kids are asking tough questions. And if we can't be willing to have those conversations with them, obviously grounded in truth, sure, rooted in Christ, rooted in of the course. word of God. You know, if we can't have those conversations, then why are they even going to want to listen to you or follow you? Right. Because <laughs> everybody, whether you're your age or mine, or you're in your early twenties or teens, yep. you want to know or have a good, con- honest conversations about things. But people that leaders that stick their head in the sand and refuse to have those conversations, I think are going to lose. So. And, 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 and I think they are losing the church. I hear mm-hmm. listen to a podcast on the way here this morning. That was mm-hmm. talking about something very similar. Hmm. Last question I have for you today in the podcast, I'm so, so blessed that you, you join me, uh, is anything else you want our listeners to know? Say, here's something I really want to download. This is really, really important. Uh, what would that be? Generational discipleship. Talk about that again. Generational discipleship is not just one person or one group segment alive. So good. We have an entire generation alive on this planet that ranges from your age. That was, you know, I would imagine in the Jesus movement of the seventies. Yeah. That's when you were in your form. Yeah. You know, yeah. I watched years. the Jesus revolution movie and cry because I remember that stuff. So, yeah. yeah. And so uh, up to, you know, this alpha generation that's alive now that we're all, a lot of people are talking about Gen Z, but no, there's the younger kids that are actually alpha. That's alpha generation. But from then until now, that's one generation. Yeah. And so as, yeah. We need to look and be bridge builders between, mm. like you said, uh, you look at me like some people call me young, some people call me old. Yeah. I felt like I'm this middle ground between sure. this like almost old wine and new wine yeah. to help you know things in. But generational generational discipleship, generational is discipleship. key for the yeah. church because yeah. it, and it, I agree. it's key for the future. Yeah. It's key for discipleship, is yeah. spiritual formation, yeah. everything within the body of Christ. So, because so we need good. to receive from you, right? And you need to also receive you from young people, it. and not just to like it. change things, but we need to receive from each other. Yeah, that's what families exactly. do. Granddads sit on the couch yeah. and watch their grandkids play. Yeah, he's the God of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph. I mean, it's at least four generations. That there, was not more. That was what the Lord showed us first with youth ministry. Mm-hmm. Was that I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the wow. God of Jacob. I'm the God of your father. Yeah, and so therefore, you don't vicariously live through. Through your parents, you develop your own personal relationship with God, but you build it off of what came before you. Beautiful. Nick Payne, thank you for being on the podcast with me today. The author, along with your lovely wife, Emily, The Secret Place of Devotion. And uh, I love the way your heart is to give away as many of these as possible. <laughs> these, you can you can get these uh, online. Yeah, Just, Amazon. Amazon, yep. that's great. And so check out the show notes. Check out more about it. You want to know more about what God's doing with Nick. It's all on there. 
And uh, we're so glad you've joined us today. And Nick, thank you for being in the studio with me. This is really fun. So again, this is the place where we learn these little changes we can make. And this is what this podcast is all about. You can make a small change. But when you obey God and make that change, it can make a massive difference in your life, life of those you serve, life of those they serve, and for generations to come. So God bless you. We we'll look forward to having you back here next week. Thank you for listening to Larry Kreider's Leadership Podcast. If you want more information about any of Larry's books, daily devotionals, small group resources, or any other teachings, go to LarryKreider.com.